Some are me, some are people own stocks. Welcome to Playing Footsie, the podcast where we talk about stocks, investing, and personal finance. Before we start, we want to make it clear that the information presented on this show is for informational and entertainment purposes only. None of us is a financial advisor, and this is not financial advice. Investing in the stock market comes with risks, and we strongly encourage our listeners to do their own research and consult with a licensed financial advisor before making any investment decisions. Now, let's dive into the world of finance and talk about what we're doing with our money. The sucker's going up. Welcome to the Playing Footsie Show. I'm here with Paul and with Steve this week, and we're talking about mostly earnings that have been coming in because it's right in the interesting bit of earnings season. We had some good reports this week from the banks and from Costco and Netflix, but we don't have time for any of those. We're too busy talking about other things that were more interesting to us, things like how our weeks have been. Uh, Steve, start with you. How's your week been? Um, yeah, it's it's been over pretty fast really um i can't really think of anything significant that i've done i I ate some ikea meatballs in the middle of the week that's about as good as it got i think um but yeah i've been on site one of the days the other days i've just been sat in the office um it's not been a very busy week for us um so yeah i haven't got much to report on in terms of stocks it's been an awful week but i imagine it's been an awful week for absolutely everybody I think I'm down about three and a half percent on the week, which actually, looking at it, isn't as bad as I thought it was. I thought I must be smashing the market in that regard. Um, but um, yeah, it's 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 fine, really. Nothing nothing to report. How about how about you, Paul? I can say good job, there's three of us this week, and how are you, Paul? Mm. <laughs> uh, well, I've I've done nothing but sit on planes all week, so it's it's been a bit boring to me as well. Um, the the market though, um, interesting one that I saw from from my portfolio. As in, I've got you know a bit of tech, a bit of safety, a bit of everything in in both directions. Um, the biggest hard hitters, I think. For me, were Blackstone, who came in a little bit light on the revenue, but that should be totally expected as far as I can see. I, I can't understand why that one took such a hit. I'm sure it's still got a huge cash position. I haven't been able to actually look at anything. So ASML also took a massive hit this week, and I've done zero looking into that. So I'm looking forward to Steve D's breakdown on that because it's going to teach me a lot. Um, uh, but on the opposite side, at and came in pretty well so the seven percent balance just um uh evened everything out so uh, it's it's largely been a flat week for me um which has been quite good wow i would take flat uh, mine has not been flat mine has been well down by the way paul if uh we know you're kind of busy at the moment but if you ever do want to check in on how uh the asml stuff is going especially the asml share price all you have to do is watch this show on any given week, and Steve has this handy gadget that can show you what the ASML share price has been doing. I think it's just over his left shoulder, and it's far too small for me to read on this screen that I can see it on. Uh, but we do have a handy ASML monitor on this show for anyone that's interested in how they're getting on. My week has been more like Steve's. It's been terrible and empty. Uh, stock market, I think nearly everything I own is down, uh, as far as I can tell. I can't see anything that's not um gone at least partly down some of it worse than others and i'm i'm seeing a red number that is bigger than the red number i've seen recently so that's i suppose a decent time to be buying stuff Uh, it looks like a reasonable time to be buying stuff it looks like stuff is on sale to me everywhere i continue to think that um reits are all underpriced happily we're not talking about any of those this week but i found another one uh for some future week that i can try and ramp higher on this show Uh, steve you look like you want to say something here yeah i was just gonna say um uh, I I also was looking at um the re um podcast that you put forward the other the other week from uh, Streetwise and I I re- I was reminded yesterday to find out what BXP was only to find out it was Boston Properties which mm-hmm. we should have known I just had no idea that was what they would either rebranded themselves to or changed the ticker to so. Um, That's always Boston been their properties. ticker from what I remember of it. They're an interesting one if you believe that um, the commercial real estate uh, pressure will be uneven, which it probably will, and you believe that quality will come out stronger than it went in. And that might be a larger assumption. But Boston Properties, I think, is one of the kind of one of the better ones in this space. If you think there big will be still some well. demand for Yeah, very I think big they're, like the third or fourth biggest in the US, I think. A 40 odd billion market. Well, there was a 40 odd billion market cap. I know everything's. Uh, gone back a bit on Friday, so so I'm not sure exactly where they are. Yeah, this week coming up is half term, uh, which means that I've got an interesting week coming up of uh, maybe some additional childcare and trying to work out how to get my parents, Alistair's grandparents, to 
to do things unsupervised by me while I try and get work done. So I'm this week mostly has been trying to get things into shape for next week and get as far as I possibly can ahead on work, which it turns out is not a million miles behind is as far ahead as I can possibly get. So if I really put a big shove in, I can be about where I'm supposed to be at the start of this week. And then I can concentrate on not panicking, but that's been basically my week outside of the stock market. Um, I've also consumed some interesting stuff. That's mostly the thing I've been doing this week, sat around listening to podcasts and not this one. Uh, the thing I've consumed is a podcast I've only just heard of, but I think I'm about the last person on the face of the earth to have heard of it. Uh, it's called Modern Wisdom. It's by a guy called Chris Williamson, who was once a contestant on Love Island, but he's far more thoughtful than I believe most contestants on Love Island are. That's me making assumptions about a show I have absolutely never watched. Uh, but he, uh, I think the tagline is something like life lessons from the smartest people on the planet. Um, it, it also includes quite a few people from what I can tell who don't fall into that category. But uh, there is some really interesting stuff in there. If, like me, you're interested in listening to famous investors, partly for their investing insight and partly for the how they run their day and how they think about the world and how they manage their lives and what principles they kind of operate under. Not to go all Ray Dalio on this for the moment, but something like that. Uh, then you might find this really interesting. From what I've seen so far, I've listened to about four episodes. I think this is an instance of, I, I've really enjoyed them, but I've been very much sat in a a kind of fairly comfortable uh, area at the moment. Steve was talking last week about the importance of listening and engaging and thinking with people who disagree with you. I've been listening mostly so far to people who say nice things about how important my part of uh, humanity is. Uh, and, and that's nice to hear too. I'm not saying they're wrong necessarily. The fact they're saying nice things doesn't mean they're false. But when we get on to more challenging bits uh, for me, I guess that'll be interesting. I really like this show. I find it very interesting, very thoughtful. Chris Williamson is very impressive uh, to me. I think at its worst, it turns into basically a large quote fest um, of people chucking yeah, around. I was just nice about slogans. to say that. At its best, there are some you... really, really interesting ideas. Paul, you know this podcast then. Yeah, you've stolen my discussion there because I'm really 50 50 on this. I think he's all, I think he's, of course, he's smart. And the people he have on, has on are, are really smart. If you want to take the latest one I listened on the plane, was Jimmy Carr. That's why I went back to it because I thought, ah, oh, Jimmy Carr's going to say some cool stuff. But it was just them two trading philosophical quotes, which a lot of them don't really have that much substance it, it was I, I don't know what to say about it. it it was it's there's sometimes they've got really good guests on and it's the same as Stephen Bartlett as well the other uh, something he's yeah he, maybe diary of a CEO I think it is Dragon's something Dead, it's called mm. yeah it, it's his stuff is quite good sometimes depends on who you get on but a lot of time it's just a therapy session for CEOs and you're just sitting there going oh right we're just gonna listen to you and fair enough there's there's stories in there that that you can gather a lot out of i just i, I don't know i see it as them whinging a lot of the time um but <laughs> you know it is really popular so i must be missing something uh i'm very 50 50 on that chris williamson one at the minute um because of that reason it's just like it's constantly like he's trying to get instagram real quotes into the stratosphere so if he says an instagram reel quote like 60 second or 30 second snip bit that he can just put out into instagram and then chop it up he's going to get popular and that seems to be his strategy and and naturally because there's no algorithm in podcasts you're using the algorithm from instagram to gain your followers and that's where he gets to and obviously there's a bit of money involved there as well but it's, you know, it's there. It is something. I did listen to it all the way through. And Jimmy Carr wasn't as insightful as I thought he'd be, which is a bit of a shame. There you go. That's my lowdown on it. <laughs> That's interesting for me because I've never heard of this podcast, nor the person. I thought Chris Williams and we were talking about the disgraced Labour MP who spent most of his time on Iranian TV. So I was thinking, like, I don't, why, would, uh, why would anyone give him a podcast and why would anyone want to go on that? Why would anyone um, call it modern wisdom? Chris. Yeah. Yeah, modern wisdom. Chris Williams is about 300 years old. I seem to remember him looking like Voldemort. To bring it back to investing, the most recent episode I was listening to was Cody Sanchez, who's a, um, I think now a hedge fund investing person, kind of angel investor, former Goldman Sachs uh, equities analyst, talking about being a contrarian. 
I thought that episode was mixed. Thought it started quite strongly and faded away a little bit. Just my view on it. But I think that's. Um, I think there's important things that kind of cross over a little bit into our uh, stuff that we think about, even if it's not explicitly a, a finance show in the same way. Steve, you've got something similar you've been listening to, right? Sort of, yeah. I, again, um, the Behind the Money podcast from the Financial Times, which I think I've recommended three times now. But this one is um, quite interesting for anybody who is slightly left-leaning on on sort of political issues. Um, because this one was titled Argentina's 16 billion saga with a US court. And it all revolves around um, uh, 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 basically an Argentinian oil company, which, you know, in order to raise money, one side of the political spectrum uh, listed it in America via an ADR. And then in 2012, when the left leaning party came over, they nationalized it. And. Um, uh, um, without paying shareholders uh, for doing it, so basically because it was listed in um, um, in in America, uh, a U.S. court has been able to rule on that um, that that um, that transaction essentially, and we have this really strange scenario where a U.S. court is uh, having jurisdiction over uh, a sovereign nation. Uh, and Argentina, a nation that probably can't afford to have any more debt, so can't really afford to pay this bill. And as such, I don't think has paid it. Um, so yeah, really, really interesting um, little sort of, and it's really quick as well. It's it's all over in 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 about fifteen twenty minutes, and you get through quite a lot of information and um, worth a listen to see where you fall really, because I think <clears throat> especially during when Corbyn was semi-popular there's a lot of people just saying well if you don't like it we'll just you know we'll nationalize this and if you don't like that well we'll just nationalize that industry and you know broadband should be nationalized and then you start to look at these things and you think well that doesn't always work uh, and since nationalizing this uh oil company it's gone awfully uh it's gone awfully to the point where they want to flog it again uh which they obviously can't do because there's this there's this court ruling over the top of it so um really interesting podcast and uh, i think you'll uh, i think you'll enjoy it for, for for a little short story yeah i don't want to i suppose um I, I i've listened to so much i can't really po- point anything out I, I can go back to howard marks again because he did that he he uh reiterated his point on the sea change this week in his podcast which was very interesting uh essentially as far as i can tell saying that this time it's different and we all know how that goes um so but he, he does rationalize it quite well uh, so that was interesting um the second i just wanted to point out is i pretty sure i just logged into the twitter for the first time in a long time and somebody has posted a photograph of uh, morgan hauser's new book so that must be nearly out or at least out um so that one i'm very much looking forward to and i'm sure you guys probably are too yeah, I was going to say, just hang fire on that one, though, before you do, because I've reached out to Morgan Housel because there's an extra chapter edition, which is through Barnes & Noble in America. And I've just asked him uh, who's getting the deal for the UK, if anybody is. So, uh, we might be able to bring you some news on that next week. There might be a, a special version to get the extra chapter edition from in the UK, I hope. Ooh, Are you looking at to be bid for, Steve, that we might introduce the playing FTSE publishing arm? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, we'll have it. <laughs> <laughs> famously, famously impressive business. Or are you going to try and hawk it onto Bloomsbury so we can all make money yeah, off of maybe, it? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I was just thinking. I just got me thinking then about um, Paul's recommendation for the <laughs> Lex Friedman podcast. Mm. I've never listened to Lex Friedman, and the, it was quite funny to see two robots talking to each other in the metaverse. But actually, <laughs> Paul's right. If yes. you have any interest in the metaverse, in fact, even if you don't have any interest in the metaverse, I would just give the first sort of five or ten minutes of that a, 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 a listen. So. The first 10 minutes is Lex Friedman trying to show you that he has some kind of emotions. He says he's going to cry, but his face like tells a different truth. Um, but when they're playing with the lighting around each other's faces in that podcast, that looks incredible. Uh, and to say that we were taking the mick out of that because it looked like Farmville only <laughs> like a year ago, the difference now is 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 is, is stark. It's a, it's, a, it's a big difference. Oh, the don't. only thing I would... Sort of point out if which would ruin the immersion. Muscles in the eyebrows, they'd be able to show it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, they look like um, like the yeah, the, the sort of like soccer mums who've got Botox in the foreheads, don't they? They they, they, they just don't yeah, they move do, at all. But, but I think what we'll, we'll, we'll break the immersion because be I think it. you'll spend a lot of it going, "Wow, this is great! This looks amazing!" But watch their arms. Their arms don't. They've got no technology to track the arms, so they just stay like glued to the sides. But Facially, picking up facial expressions, picking up the little minute movements in the corner of your mouth and the corner of your eyes and the wrinkles in your forehead. It does a very, very good job of that. And it does look really realistic. But the Zuckerberg Half does explain arms. that. Yeah, Zuckerberg does explain that they had to go through an hour of scanning each in a high-tech machine to, to get this. But he thinks, and they have a working version where the vast majority of this can be done by essentially just waving a phone in front of your face until it picks up these minute movements. But um, it might be one of those things that you have to set up and it, you know, and it works forever. Um, interesting though. I, I would recommend people just, just spending five or 10 minutes just watching that and seeing how far that technology has come along. Okay. Uh, in that case, that's enough of what we've been consuming. Um, this week. No one really cares about what we've been consuming anyway, and we're starting to run out of ideas. Steve, what has everyone else been consuming? Specifically, what have US teens been consuming over the last, um, however long it was since we last talked about this subject? Well, um, I've been watching. <laughs> I've was not been year? watching them through my. I've not been watching them through my. No, six months is a. Uh, this, uh, thank you. Not yeah. been watching them through my telescope. <laughs> this is the Piper Sandal Teen Server. Um, and they do this every six months. And last time we did this, a lot of people said it was quite insightful um, and that they quite enjoyed it. So I've had a really good scan through the report again. And I found out sort of 24 things that I thought were quite important and um, something that you can maybe lean towards your sort of stock purchases your, or your conviction in certain stocks. So um, <clears throat> 37% of teens hold a part-time job. So when people say that teens don't work, um, thirty-seven percent of them was. Unfortunately, that is actually down from uh, in spring when it was forty percent. Um, teens' self-reported spending was down one percent year on year to about two thousand three hundred sixteen dollars. That's also down four percent. Parent contribution was sixty-two percent up from sixty percent. So uh, parents are definitely lending money for kids to spend still. They're not lending um, it, are they? Are they lending well, money for their yeah, kids? Yeah, lending spend? in the yeah, not giving. <laughs> Um, it's a long term yield. <laughs> it's a sixty yeah. year yield. That is. <laughs> yeah. Bank of mum and dad lending. Sorry, Steve. Carry um, on. Upper income teens. Food is the number one wallet priority uh, for males, spending at twenty five percent share. Uh, clothing remains top of female wallet share at twenty eight percent. That's down two hundred and sixty basis points versus uh, last year, when female clothing wallet share peaked at thirty percent. The core beauty wallet, Steve, uh, cosmetics, skincare, and fragrance was $324 a year. That's up 23% year on year. That was led by cosmetics, which is up 33% year on year. Uh, keeping on cosmetics, they held the highest was. priority mm-hmm. of beauty spending at $127. That's the highest level we've seen for about three, four years now. Uh, weekly usage of VR devices declined to less than 10% from just less than 14% in spring 23. But actually now, a third of teens own a VR device, up from 29% back in spring 23. Uh, Video Hmm. games, about 11% of male teen wallet share. That's actually fallen. It used to be 12%. 33% now expect to purchase a next-generation console within the next two years. Um, In terms of um, banking, uh, Square's Cash App was number one. It was the most preferred for peer-to-peer money transfers. About 50% of them, um, teens surveyed, said that was their preferred. Venmo came in second at 36%, so a, you know, a duopoly in that sense. Uh, for buy now, pay later, pay later, it was different though. PayPal's paying for was used the most frequently, followed by Square's Afterpay. Apple Pay ranked number one for payment apps within the last month at 42%. Cash App was second at 27%. 55% of teens cited Amazon as their number one favorite e-commerce site. And then there was Sheen, Sheen, Sheen. I don't know how to pronounce that. Nike, Goat, and This Timo is a new one. Sheen's, Sheen's a new five. one that I've only seen recently. Uh, just to let you know, mm. it's going to IPO soon as well. This is what's uh, so destroying. To look at. Yeah, this is what's destroying Boohoo and ASOS, isn't it? Sheen. Um, it's huge where so Nike I remains am the number currently one brand. living. I'm sorry. Just doing a Becky, that's okay. all. Uh, 
Nike remains the number one brand for all teams in both apparel, 35%, and footwear, 61%. Uh, New Balance has now surpassed Vans as number four favorite footwear brand. New Balance gained about 200 basis points of mind share year on year. Vans lost about 350 basis points of mind share year on year. Crocs came in at number six. Hey Dude came in at number seven. Uh, they were the favourite footwear brand amongst um, of the favourite footwear brands against all uh, amongst all teams. They gained thirty basis points and fifty basis points. Hoka came on in at number two thousand and seventy-five. <laughs> <laughs> on running and Hoka one one uh, were number eight and number thirteen uh, across all teams. But in the upper income category, they were fifth and third uh, in terms of athletic brands. So, and that's because they're so bloody expensive. Uh, in terms of um, Number one cosmetics brand, that was ELF, or ELF, uh, increasing 13 points year on year. It's uh, now 29% for female teens. Um, specialty retail for beauty purchases reached the highest level yet at 79%. This is your your ultras and things like that. Uh, mass department drug stores, they've reached a new low of 11%. So if you're thinking your kids are going to start going to Walgreens to buy their cosmetics, which is a high percentage of their wallet share, that seems unlikely. Um, so number one was I think it's Sephora, but it might be Sephora. Um, but that's now surpassed Ulta for the number Sephora. one preferred beauty destination. Ulta is number two. Uh, that that had the the strongest loyalty membership at sixty seven percent. Ulta's was at sixty, so still very very strong. <clears throat> Chick Fil A remains the number one restaurant uh, in the US. It had a sixteen percent share. It was followed by Starbucks at thirteen percent and McDonald's at nine percent. Teams. Teens wanting to consume plant-based meat has hit an all-time low. Um, it's had a 35% fall this year, and it was 49% willing to try in spring 21. Um, teens reporting their highest intentions to eat more or the same amount of Mondelez Cliff Bar, CBP's Goldfish Cracker Bars, I think they're called. Uh, they were the most popular uh, snack brand. Monster, 28%, Red Bull, 23%, and Celsius, 16%, and now Team's favourite energy drink brands. Celsius is uh, coming in at 16% is quite interesting because their market share is only about 10% of the market as well. So interesting that this came back uh, so strong. Uh, 70% of teams use Spotify, um, up from 68% just six months ago. 46% of these teams actually subscribe and pay for it as well, which is up from 44%. Uh, in terms of favourite social platform, Steve, it was TikTok at 38%. Snap was second with 28%. And Instagram was third with 23%. And last couple of bits for you here. Teens spend 28.7% of daily video consumption watching Netflix, which is down a little bit. 29.1% watching YouTube, which is up a little bit. And 87% of teens surveyed owned an iPhone, and 88% expect an iPhone to be their next phone. But only 34% of them own an Apple Watch at the moment. So, tons of information there. Appreciate people might have to go through that a few times, but that was what I pulled out the survey. I think it's really interesting, and because we're all old and don't know what kids want nowadays, and then really interesting. it's an interesting little thing. Yeah, a few bits of there kind of stood out um, to me. One that you said towards the end, actually, which was favorite social media platforms. TikTok is not a massive surprise uh, to me. I I would have said TikTok or Instagram. I'm surprised at seeing Snap second. I thought Snap was uh, basically garbage or basically dead or basically waiting to be acquired by, by something. But it's popular with teens, huh? 5% stronger than Instagram, so it's it's quite quite considerably more popular with um with teens so, so the and that's kind of interesting because when we think of what the future is going to be it's what the teens are at now right yeah yeah so the difference with snap it seems is you could make it into a sort of little dating app as well because it's it's geotagged and geolocated so you can literally go on a map and see what videos of people people are posting in your vicinity right around you Instagram hasn't quite got there yet, but it has got a similar tool which can do that. I'm not sure about TikTok because um, I really use that the least, if I'm honest. Um, interesting, Mondelez Cliff Bars were number one snack for teens in the US. Did I hear that right? I don't know what they are. I don't know what they are. They're they're like these little. Um, I think they. I think I'm pretty sure if I. Just Google it quickly. I'm pretty sure they are. Best yeah, traveled of us yeah, here, they Paul. are. They are. No, no, they're branded to um, 
climbers, as in like it's like you you would have seen them if you live. I mean, he lives in the north, for God's sake. You you would have seen them. They're like these little brown packets with a little climber on. I'm pretty sure that's what they are. The Mondelez cliff bars. Yeah, I'm just looking. They're at like now, high yeah, energy. I've, I've never I've, I've never seen them before in my life. Yeah, they're little energy like flapjack bars. Oh, yeah, that sort of thing, and that's really really surprises me. That's quite interesting. And so this this sort of thing, then, do we think that? Teenagers grow up and move on to different things, or these are the things that grow up with teenagers. What What do we think? I think in the main, these are things that grow up with teenagers. There are a few kind of exceptions, mm. maybe. I think teenagers spend more time in places like Chick Fil A, McDonald's, and whatever you said the other one was. Uh, Subway uh, was the other one you mentioned. I think I think they spend more time in these places than uh, older adults um, do once they hit sort of thirty or whatever it is. I think I was talking to some of my friends the other day who. Say they genuinely can't remember the last time they were in a McDonald's, um, and this is not kind of with their with their kids or whatever. I can I can remember last time I was in McDonald's. I was in the other week. I still like them, but it seems like people really kind of go off that. Um, teens like it because it's cheap, I think, and uh, fairly unfussy, yeah. and and they're fine there. But maybe it's the part of the world that I live in, and at least people have pretensions on um, being kind of higher minded than McDonald's, but. I feel like McDonald's <laughs> is constantly the place for people who are teens, um, but not necessarily people who move on from being teens and so on. So there'll be another cohort of teens coming in to take their place. I mean, fewer in the US because birth rate's quite low there, but um, it feels to me like that they, they aim at that kind of level and they stay at that level. They're a bit like kids' TV shows, right? They don't stay with you as you, as you grow up, but your kids might come in and watch them after you, I think, anyway. Steve? Yeah, I was just going to say, this is... Um... It's the the brand's job to keep these people spending there as they as they, as they grow through life. So they you know they, they can't just appeal to you know just to teens. They've got to have a, a, a an adult range as well. So if um you know it's, I don't see many brands here that are just you know aimed at kids only. So um mm. you know it's their responsibility to 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 keep some kind of loyalty program that keeps these people retaining throughout the whole the whole life otherwise it's a fad and not a trend isn't it and you want these companies to to be into getting new trends rather than fads uh, i think is generally the case i was wondering where vivo barefoot came in the trainers one i'm i'm gonna have to go back and have a look at that because that seems very very popular with at least early 20s at the moment as they go through these again they're following the quotes on instagram david goggins and all that stuff and um they seem to be buying into these sorts of I don't know if the fads they they may be legit. I'm, I'm not sure, but you mentioned Hoka, and that's obviously and on one as well. They seem to be older brands that that older older people have sort of sort of started to pick up. I wonder if that's going to be a trend as well. It, it, Jack it, it looks like buying doughy people. <laughs> yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's what it is. Um, yeah, Mondelez, Nike. What else was in there that? investing uh, for 30 ELF, years elf beauty or ELF, something yeah um, yeah, yeah monster becky, the, the becky monster's ETF. still been very popular yeah monster that's going to be there for a while i've noticed a lot of other companies move into the energy drinks market of you i i noticed rio hmm. energy the other day and i thought okay this is getting out of hand now coca in there as well uh with various mm. things they're trying to move bottled water and uh, when you think about coke and you think about the question of growth it's very natural to wonder, well, exactly how many more lots of Coke can you get into the hands of Americans, basically? Uh, and the growth isn't really mm. supposed to be that. It's supposed to be things like energy drinks, like bottled water, uh, and it's mostly supposed to be kind of emerging market based. I think probably the one of these that I think, uh, to your initial question, Paul, I think is likely to kind of grow with the teens. I mean, famously, Apple's iPhone is supposed to be quite a sticky thing uh, to get rid of. And Steve said, I think something like 80% of them think their next phone is going to be an iPhone. I mean, maybe some of them are wrong about that. And maybe some of them are, are wrong the other way. 88%, right? So that's, uh, if you assume that nearly all teens have a phone and therefore will replace at some point, I think that's probably quite likely. That might be close to like 88% of teens, uh, basically, then in that case, that think uh, their their next phone is going to be an iPhone and that's the one more than the rest of these that appears to well it very definitely has at least some switching costs associated with it uh, exactly how high you think they are is kind of 
questionable, but it's far easier to switch away from McDonald's or Cliff Bars than it is from uh, an iPhone in this way. So that's the one where I think I own shares in um, Apple. That kind of encourages me a bit, right? If we, if you want to try and hook people into an ecosystem and you think 88% of them, once they reach teen and upwards, are likely to be uh, in there already and then either trying to get out or, or unable to get out or whatever, uh, then that's the one that I think is probably uh, I'm most encouraged by in terms of long-term trend stuff. The one that shocked someone... me the most, oh. I think, was the video games being such a low amount of, of mm. wallet share, only, mm. only coming in at 11% and falling from 12% only in yeah. um, the fall when we looked at it. Um, sorry, in, in spring when we looked at it last time. So that's quite interesting to me. I, I would have thought that would have been higher because that's 11% of male teen wallet share as well, which you, you would say video games, are they skewed towards males? Maybe maybe that's not true. But um, it is quite a low amount of wallet share in, in comparison to the other things. Is it because their parents are buying everything for them? Potentially, yeah, potentially. It's it's very possible that, you know, because they're such big purchases, games are very big purchases, the consoles themselves are very big purchases, they might not actually be coming out of the teen's wallet, and that might be something involved. To go back to Apple, uh, as somebody who has done the transition from Apple to Android, I can assure you that it was extremely sticky and extremely hard to get off. They make it stupid hard for you to get off. And not to mention, once you once you have got off, the social um ousting that you get from that is really really tough in fact whatsapp and facebook are probably the only two things that have saved my social life um as far as that goes which is which could be a really strange instance because you go from the blue uh is it the blue bubble to the green bubble and all of a sudden uh that's it people you're you're not you're not placed as high of a priority on people's phones as you were when you were an Apple customer. It's quite interesting. Although that could just be uh, my excuse for no one liking me. That is... Or responding to your messages, yeah. Fascinating to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on. We, we, we've covered that a lot. Okay. Uh, in that case, let's talk about some earnings. Let's start ourselves off with one then that I was supposed to be talking about last week, but we ran out of time. And Paul is right. If we don't get on with this, it will happen again. So, uh, Crowder International, a UK stock, which means, of course, they have a base in what city, Paul? See, if you watch the show more often, you will know that every... Omaha? Uh, <laughs> yeah. You will know that every UK-based uh, company is, of course, headquartered within a two-mile radius of Steve's house. Uh, Steve's Crowder house, International. Yeah. yeah, in Hull. There we go. Uh, so, Hull-based Crowder International. Uh, next to Hull based BNM bargains just around the corner from Hull based Halma and just across the street from Hull based Diploma. Um, and Hull based uh, Daifuku and Sweden Handels Banker. Uh, yeah, that thing too. Wait, um, are, they, <laughs> are they still using the ports in Hull? Is that what it is? There's still shipping ports in Hull. No, I, I, I only found out the other day that they've actually sold the uh, 700 million pound facility to Cargills uh, in, in, in Hull. So it was a, a sizable um, outfit. But yeah, Crowder are actually in Hull anymore. Yeah, so Crowder are not in that. Hull anymore. Um, and related to that point, cause and effect and so on, right? Their stock is down 38% uh, over the last 12 months, which makes it the worst performing FTSE 100 stock. You move out of Hull Commercial Center at your peril. Uh, the reason I was talking about this or getting ready to talk about this last week is because the thing had fallen another 7% um, after their latest trading update, i.e. earnings report with no numbers in it. Um, so the kind of headline news here is they're expecting profits for the year to be 20% lower than their expectations, which is not good because their expectations were already significantly lower than the year before. They're now looking for between 300 and 320 million versus what was going to be 370 to 400 million for the year uh they have a 5.7 billion market cap by the way just for uh, context and for context that is now they have a 5.7 billion market cap at the time we're recording this which is saturday the 21st uh it was obviously a lot higher um 12 months ago it was 38 percent um that's come off it so they're 44 quid share price they're looking for earnings per share of two dollars uh, two dollars crikey Oh, shoot me. £2.14 uh, to £2.29. Um, and that's compared to £4.65 in 2022. Uh, before that, they were looking at, uh, before the kind of COVID-y stuff, they were £1.70 to £1.80 sort of region. Um, 
what's going on here then? So this is a chemicals company. They sell chemicals, uh, specialty chemicals, so not commodity chemicals into end markets. They are things like consumer care. So they're busy whacking stuff into ELF or ELF beauty products, uh, maybe. Uh, crop protection, pharma, and industrial stuff. And their big growth arm as they see it, which is the only one that's showing any kind of resilience anyway, is pharma. Their lipids business sells into mRNA vaccines. And if you think mRNA vaccines are the future, which a lot of people do, and Croda, I suppose, are hoping they are, uh, this could be pretty good. Everything else, though, is selling off and demand is way, 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 way down. The reason being, inventory levels are far too high. Inventory levels got built during the pandemic, and they are currently... Um, still at fairly elevated levels and Crowda has been wrong for about the last six to 12 maybe months about how quickly that inventory is going to work its way off so their update their trading updates this is why that stock has been falling for the last year have been along the lines of inventory level where end users is still way too high therefore demand is still way down therefore we're still not selling anything therefore it's really hard to, to kind of make any money Someone asked me in the Discord uh, whether this big 38% sell-off thing is a buying opportunity here. And I can see the case for thinking it is. You would expect that. The stock obviously went on a massive run during the COVID thing while people thought £4.65 is the earnings forever. And if you think four sixty five is the earnings forever, then a 44 quid share price, which is sort of where we are. We're now at 40 quid share price, actually. But even 44 quid share price is, is pretty cheap. Um, obviously, that was not the case. That's how it was going to work out forever. Uh, but people sort of, uh, the stock went on a massive run like it does. Since then, it's been coming down and down and down and down. If you think, by the way, you've heard this story before, it's the same story kind of as Synthoma, which is my pick for JKR investing, and I'm still losing on that. The main difference between Crowder and Synthoma, uh, as far as I can tell, is uh, there's a difference at the product level, but at the investor kind of level, the main difference is that Crowder's balance sheet is not a mess, and Synthoma's is. Crowder doesn't have creditors banging on its doors anytime soon. I think they can ride out a kind of cyclical downturn. It's not good uh, for them. They will want to cut costs, and lower sales are not helpful, and they can do with end markets recovering sooner rather than later. But I don't think they're a kind of big bankruptcy risk in the way that Synthoma uh, might be if things don't kind of shape themselves up and they sell off units at a decent price in the way that they're currently doing. So is there a question of buying the low here? Well, it's at a five-year low. It's not. It's like below pre-COVID levels here. You have to think this business is in worse shape or uh, the environment is somehow worse than it was when it started. Arguably, it is. Interest rates are higher than they were back then, so you shouldn't be pricing it the same. But its earnings are coming in at, let's say, 214 to 229 in a bad year is still sort of 10 20% higher than they were pre-COVID. I can see why this might be attractive here. Um, Steve, has this now moved out of your circle of competence as a result of having moved out of your postcode funny you ask because i'm just looking where crowder is now headquarters uh, oh, and it's about, in oxford is it no it's about 20 miles away in it, just oh, outside okay. of a place called ghoul um, oh right which yeah is evidently why the share price is falling mm. um but yeah they, they, they have a look at headquarters if you get a second uh people it's it's a, like a massive stately home I, I was not expecting that to to be the office but um, yeah, so look, I, I didn't know Crowder did as many things as, as they actually do here because I, I seem to, in my head, I just thought it was a paint factory and I thought that that was basically what they did was paints. But no, they, they, they're in, involved in a in a hell of a lot of things. Um, interested in the, the being part of the lipid systems, interested in the life sciences, inter uh, in the industrial specialties division as well. There's, there's a lot of uh, interesting bits in here which are just going through sort of cyclically weak demand uh, and and yet they're still expecting profit before tax to be you know in the three hundred to three twenty million range. Looking at the market cap quickly, you are at what five point seven one billion at the moment. It says mm -hmm. on um, on yep. uh, yeah on Google. So uh, it's still it's not cheap. It's not really really cheap. It's not it's not UK market cheap. But um, this is a a premium business with. Um, with potentially some some growth um, prospects. Yeah, well, I so. tried to work out what that meant for EPS. I got sort of two fourteen to two twenty nine forty share price seventeen times earnings. That's higher yeah. than the average for the FTSE one hundred. So you need to be thinking it's going to grow faster than than the average for the index. Um, it might. Uh, there's definitely worse businesses in that in that big index, and uh, it's, it might well it's be traded at much faster than higher than that, though. Or nearly double yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that that kind of range. It's been in the thirties to thirty six. Yeah, when I first looked at this ages ago, it was in the sort of thirties, and I thought it looks really good, 
but um, I couldn't bring myself to buy it at 30. Not for a particularly good reason. I hadn't got any ideas about inventory levels coming through and COVID push and that sort of thing. Just thought, I, I, I kind of thought this looks really good. And I, I still kind of think it looks good. I think the issue for them and the issue for investors, and this is true in so many different areas that we'll come back to in uh, as we look through other companies as well. They are trying to work out what supply and demand looks like in normal circumstances for them, right? Because they've gone through a period of artificially high demand. Um, and now they're going through a period of artificially low demand because inventory levels won't be too high forever. There won't be a COVID pandemic forever. So it's not that. And it's not this. And the question is, where does that kind of fit in uh, in the middle of this? And that's the kind of hard bit, right, to, to try and predict if you're an investor. And that's the, the real sort of challenge here. I wonder whether you might think that they're, um, I mean, 70, yeah, the 17 earnings, I move in circles a little bit here, right? I think earnings per share, okay, this is a bad year and it's going to be higher than 2018, 2019, 2017, all that sort of thing. So it's it's growing um, if that's what you consider a bad year. And if you think uh, things will get better before they get kind of uh, eventually anyway, then it looks okay. But um, we're still looking at 17 times earnings. UK stock, uh, could you find cheaper? I mean, yeah, you certainly could. What? What's its lowest? What's its mean average? You know, because obviously we, we, we know there's there's different types of stocks out there. You've got your growth stocks in the, you know, mega, mega cap tech. They trade at 30 times earnings and we sort of see 22 times earnings as quite reasonable, you know, a reasonable time to buy sometimes. No one expects the likes of Apple and Google. I'm not saying it won't. I'm just saying that no one expects it to go down to 15 times earnings anymore. And then you've got the whole mess of stocks in the middle, which seem to run at that that whole average of 15 to 16 times earnings. And then you've got that side lot of defensive type stocks that tend to trade high. Costco, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, those sorts of stocks that tend to trade quite high on earnings in general. So when they make that little drop down to 17 times earnings, is that like a relative low for some of these stocks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I mean, in the case of Croda, um, they they got up to really quite high levels. I'm looking, they were at around, oh, what am I reading there? 101, quid. yeah, 101, 104 quid a share while they were busy making Ooh. four in sort of earnings, so about 25. They might have got close to 30 times earnings, if you think, from the year before of 2021. So 30 is the high end. I think 17 might be towards the lower end, uh, to be honest, and, mm. and then you kind of mean somewhere in the middle. But I don't think they spend much time in their kind of, uh, mean reversion average thing. I don't think they tend to be yeah. at 20. They tend to be kind of either side of that and you get a uh, an average by taking the high point and the low point here, even if it never really gets to there very often. Steve? Been an incredible investment, this though, Steve. If you bought this one at IPO, it was nearly a 50x at its peak and it's still, mm. what, an 18x today despite falling 60% from its peak. So that's a that's quite an impressive return, that isn't it, for a, well, what I thought was just a paint company. <laughs> yeah, I IPO'd around the time I did, by the way, as well, by the look of it. Um, July yeah, in 1988, July. I was a month later. Uh, but yeah, um, uh, that's so my thought on this is that I don't see this as a kind of screaming obvious uh, buy right at the moment. I think if you like buying good companies, it's well worth a look. If it keeps falling, and it is keep falling, uh, by the way, at the moment, um, this could get really interesting and you could get a nice opportunity here because there clearly are um not artificial they really exist but uh cyclical um headwinds for this which i think are going to kind of fall off and i do think Rhoda will be okay so the risk with cyclical thing or the big risk with cyclical pressures is that they could kill you uh basically if you don't make any money for long enough eventually you go out of business but i think i don't see that happening in the case of Crowder. sorry steve just going to say quickly um before we do shuffle on um there's a business breakdowns this week on Olin, which is mm. a, a chemicals company chemicals yeah, there was yeah, one on there. Um, either Dow or DuPont the other week as well. Very, very interesting, the one on um, on Erlin, because it's yeah. a company that's trying to smooth out their cyclicality in terms of um, mm. in terms of demand. So it'd be a really interesting one for people to do a comparison on. But I uh, appreciate we've got 15 minutes, which is seven and a half minutes on ASML and seven and a half on Tesla. So shall I quickly rattle through ASML? No, take your time on ASML. We'll just fit everything on Tesla into the last 10 seconds and put it out as a short. Okay, It'd be fair pretty enough. easy, right? Um, so, <laughs> ASML, uh, this was a decent report. I think this is what we've probably come to expect from ASML. So, system sales came in at about 5.3 billion euros on the quarter. 
Uh, there was growth in all of their areas except EUV and metrology, which had uh, double digit falls. Now, as you know, with systems at this size and price, that literally means just a handful of systems didn't ship in time. Um, if you add in install base management, which is what you would call servicing, I guess, to system sales, you get about 6.7 billion in euros. Uh, that was growth of about 15%. Cost of sales came in at 3.2 billion, leaving gross profit of about 3.5 billion. That was flat year on year. Op profit came in at 32% margin, which was down one percentage point. Net profit, uh, 1.9 billion, which was 28% margin, also down one percentage point. So financially, loads to love there. Uh, looking at logic and memory sales, this year has clearly been about fulfilling logic demand. Uh, they've already fulfilled 2.5 billion more um, in, in logic orders than all of last financial years with a quarter still to go. Uh, quarterly net bookings were 2.6 billion, of which 0.5 billion are for EUVs, finishing a short two quarters uh, of sequential acceleration. Q1 uh, net bookings were 3.75, Q2 4.5 billion. So this is actually the highest drop in ASML's backlog um, that we've had. Um, during 2023, uh, this is giving signs of sort of like uncertain short-term outlook from some semiconductor um, companies. But uh, China, South Korea, and Taiwan made up over 75 percent of all orders shipped for the second month running. Uh, USA slipped from 10 percent uh, or, or from orders last quarter to just 5 percent this time. In terms of capital return, 100 million of buybacks in the last quarter, dividend of um, a euro 45. Um, the next dividend will be uh, the same amount again. In terms of outlook, ASML, we're looking at about $6.9 billion at the midpoint next quarter, gross margin between 50 and 51%. R&D and sg &A to come in at just a touch over $1.3 billion. Reaffirmed the previous guidance of about 30% growth, slight gross margin improvement. So all good as far as I, concern, um, I was concerned. So I listened to the call with respect to bookings. Um, Peter Wenning said... Uh, there was some weakness was expected, uh, more so given how the backlog has built up in the last couple of years. However, given his view on how strong of a year 2025 would be, he thinks bookings will start to recover and he will start giving those signs around um, and towards the end of 2024 and perhaps by the first half, he said. And then uh, CFO Dassen said um, there's some really good quality fabs coming on in the next uh, online in the next couple of years. They'll need the tools. Demand is strong. Uh, there were lots of questions on the call about China. ASML said, actually, it's a minimal impact to sales as the vast majority of products sold on mature nodes. They're not covered by the ban. It's actually only a handful of fabs in, in China that are affected by the ban. Um, so with all this in mind, uh, what did they predict that they will grow revenue in 2024? Was it 10? Was it 20? Or was it 30%? Not even close. It was zero. ASML is predicting that they'll be flat next year. And that sent the market into a little bit of a panic and ASML fell quite a bit the next day. However, got to bear in mind, Peter said, looking ahead to 2025, we expect significant growth year since more than 50% of our EUV and DUV shipments will go to brand new fab projects. So what are we doing here uh, with ASML? I think at the moment, absolutely nothing. I think there's no need to panic. Um, I think we're expecting a fairly flat year next year, so I wouldn't expect massive appreciation in stock price unless um, ASML gets some get some hype out about what's what's coming in 2025. Um, but yeah, I I thought this was a very fine report and nothing really too exciting in it at all for me. Wonderful confirmation bias there for for me to be honest with you. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't think you've said anything I didn't already hope that you were going to say the zero uh, percent growth next year was quite you know you looked at it and i kind of went ah, it doesn't really make s yeah it makes sense there's lot lots of places not ordering at the moment there's a lot of uncertainty nobody wants to get in out over the skis at the moment and um, so everyone's just taking a bit of a chill but the, the my thoughts were that the arizona uh, fab fab companies are going to open in the next couple of years that's going to start a ton of orders for asml they're only going to go to asml in fact we'll talk about that in a second as well i'm sure you'll you'll want to mention the 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 japanese getting in on um euv at the moment um but uh the it seems like the U.S. share, which I think was 5%, did you say? It's only 5% this year. Um, the U.S. share of their their revenue is probably going to go up significantly in 2025, and that's what we're looking forward to. I bought 
uh, probably not on their full drop, but I bought uh, probably three, four hundred pounds worth just to just to keep my uh, keep my averaging up on that. Um, very happy. I, I can't can't see a reason. The only other reason why the drop. So there's a couple of reasons why the drop may have been extended. Of course, ASML could well be overbought. It could well be overvalued, as it were. I don't think it is in the long run. The long run of the um, 30 years. It was around 55 times earnings, wasn't it? It's probably a bit lower than that. Probably more like 40 times earnings at the moment now. Um, but also, Canon appear to be bringing on uh they they reckon they've made a different type of breakthrough in euv and i think that spooked the market it all came at once uh, canon seemed to release their news about this a few days before asml's earnings release and it doesn't appear like it's too much of a threat at this time in fact it it all seemed theoretical in in my brain um a lot of people saying that this is where china's now going to get their EUV technology from from the future, and I can't see that happening. Do you have any thoughts on that, or have I kind of just um, brought that out to you a bit unexpected? No. So I read about nano imprinting, which is um, um, Canon's uh, way of challenging um, the EUV machine that ASML is is putting out. It looks like interesting technology, but I don't think your likes of TSMC, Samsung, which are and in in Intel, I suppose now we can say which are experts in using these machines, are going to quickly jump over to Canon unless there's a serious uh, price difference between the model, which hasn't been uh, released yet. So you're looking at about between two and five hundred million for an ASML machine, uh, uh, and that is just because of the sheer amount of parts and uh, and bits that go into it. That you know genuinely costs that much to set up, install, deliver. There's something the size of a double decker bus. Um, so unless Canon comes out with some pricing, which is you know, incredibly under ASML. I, I don't see the jump away because it's a whole new system for for these companies to to learn. Uh, uh, especially from a company that uh, up until this point has basically focused on making you know lower quality, older sort of um, less intelligent chips. So it's an interesting one. It's probably one of those that uh, if Canon comes out with a good price for this, it might be worth holding a basket of both. Um, but otherwise, um, I think it's a, a wait and see at the moment. Yeah, it's the timeline. You've got probably 30 years of testing. And in that time, ASML are hoping to be on the next stage. And so uh, I think there's, uh, I think I don't, I'm not, I'm not totally worried, but I, I do think it spooked the market, which may have led to a buying opportunity. I'm not saying it's a buying opportunity. I was just buying it. Um, you guys need to go off and figure that out for yourself. Any other you should think it's a buying issues? opportunity, Paul. Um, this PE right number I've got written down is much lower than the one you had. You've got it at 40 or so, and right. I think if it was at 40, it would have taken more of a whack than it did. I've got this at a PE ratio of about 29, 28 uh, at the moment. Oh, and, really? Uh, looking at backward earnings. There we go, then. And that sort of speaks to, to my thought on this one, which is that... Steve and I, or Steve sent me very briefly, or we were looking at um, a different company, which is Intuitive Surgical, which nearly everyone sort of knows about. It's not a million miles in terms of um, style of business from ASML. They make highly advanced surgical robots, but they came in with some light earnings, I think, and their stocks could whack this week. Uh, and my reaction to that was um, my reaction I've always had when I thought about intuitive surgical. If I don't understand why this thing is so expensive, I get that there's a price for predictability, and that much is pretty good in the case of intuitive surgical but the thing's been growing its earnings whether you look at them at op income level or earnings per share level about seven percent for the last decade trades at a price earnings ratio of about 70 uh, and i think that's a lot to pay for something that's growing like that and people go on about how good of a visit is business it is brian feroldi talks about it a lot he's not wrong but it doesn't seem to make the kind of money that i think it needs to make at the market cap it has uh, and it does this repeatedly and eventually, uh, the market kind of went whack, and it still trades at about 70 times uh, earnings ratio, by the way. But um, when you're up there on big numbers, any kind of kind of bad news or slowing growth or whatever, like, say, forecasting static top line for the next year in the case of ASML, uh, doesn't play very well. And I think that's kind of uh, reasonable here. This looks to me like um, I think of this like I think of Croda, uh, to be honest with you, okay? It's a bit of a cyclical downturn in kind of people not wanting to get out over their skis as you 
uh, put it. So um, future orders are, are down from where they were before. That will turn itself around. The question is when, and, and the market will treat this justifiably uh, as something that didn't have the outlook that it uh, they thought it did. The time you want to buy it is when they think it doesn't have as positive an outlook as opposed to when they do, uh, and that might be that might be now, and that might be the case. That um, again, to your thought about kind of average PEs, Paul. 20 something is relatively low uh, in the range that this kind of stuff trades in. Maybe this is your opportunity. It's it's strange, isn't it? Because I think people have reacted this in a, in a really strange scenario. So say, for instance, you know the PlayStation 5 was coming out. The day before, you wouldn't rush out to go buy the PlayStation 4, uh, at, you know, full market rate. And that's kind of how it is with ASML at the moment. They've got a brand new machine on the, on the horizon. Um, and people are wondering why uh, the backlog's dropping slightly and why they're, they're expecting a flat year. And I think it, it is as simple as, as that analogy. I think people are just waiting for the brand new machine. Um, it would seem pointless to have uh, the, the other one at the moment. Um, just having a really quick look at uh, Nano Imprint, uh, there's a number of issues with it at the moment in that the yield on really high-end chips is quite bad. Um, and the reason why you buy these cutting edge um, machines from ASML is that the yield on high end chips is, is quite good and uh, ASML quite regularly improve it. So uh, I think there's plenty of work here for, for Canon to do. I think um, I don't think we're uh, immediately going to get, um, get get out positioned here. All right. Speaking of stocks dropping based on weak earnings and uh overbought stocks tesla is down 15 percent on this week uh because of rather poor a uh, rather poor earnings report um uh, well we can discuss whether it was a poor, poor earnings report uh tesla uh, let me just get my numbers up there we go tesla reported 23.35 billion in revenue that's up 13 percent year on year but only reported 1.85 billion in profits that is putting them on course to have their second earnings decline year in a row uh that's uh, quite an interesting point still uh, really low r d spend uh orders not getting through very well i think there was less deliveries i'm not going to go over the numbers too much because i think they're they're already out there but in general what we were waiting for was the earnings call we were gonna um i'm not i think Probably like you guys, I'm not really interested in Tesla anymore. There was a point in a couple of years ago where we were all interested in seeing what Tesla was doing to grow, and uh, and now I don't really look. The when these earnings came out, all I wanted to see was the earnings call and how Elon Musk was going to wiggle his way out of this one. And um, personally, he did pretty terribly. I don't know if you guys have actually seen it, but he was talking about the Cybertruck, how it's not going to be delivered on time, it's not going to be cash flow positive for a good few years. Uh, the, one of the key points I saw were he believes he has over a million people who have reserved the car, and that means there's a huge, uh, there's no demand issue whatsoever. But we have to remember that these reserves were $100 and fully refundable if you didn't want the car anymore. So I just don't see that as a metric that you can trust. Uh, the in this in the earnings call when I listened to this, I felt like he was very very much just changing the subject all the time. Whenever there was a question about profitability, about R and D spend, or you know whether AI was going to work out, he would always change it to someone else. I think at one point he even just went on a rant about uh, working from home, and he was saying how people who who are working from home are still morally incorrect uh, because everybody else doesn't have the same uh, opportunities that they do coming from the richest man in the world who has a lot of opportunities and doesn't share that out at all it's it was a really odd and it's cool a lot of squirming around a lot of trying to justify things it's like he's been caught red-handed what are we starting to see here with tesla how do you feel my thoughts on tesla were sort of twofold there's as there always is with earnings calls there's um there's the backward looking bit where they tell you what they did over the last three months and there's the forward looking bit where they tell you what they're going to do the next three months and and kind of beyond in some cases um and uh, the stock went down and uh, we were chatting to someone on the trading 212 forum who actually made a lot better sense of this than i did i've now forgotten his name in steve's thread uh on the on the subject, but was asking why there wasn't a bigger decline when Tesla read their kind of backwards looking numbers out and then said, oh, hang on. No, there it is. It's after the guidance bit, uh, which I thought was pretty, pretty sharp. That makes a lot of sense um, to me. 
So, okay, the numbers were were what they were. Um, You might think on the face of it, they don't look terribly impressive, but I don't think anyone should have been massively surprised by this. Tesla has been discounting over the last quarter. So, so margins come down when you discount things. That's kind of how that works and how that happens. And that's just what discounting does from what I can see of it. It's also known that they've had um, operational issues, I think, out of Shanghai. It was a shutdown on their factory there. So, so fewer cars came out of it. Sure, uh, that was also known about and shouldn't have been surprising anybody to learn that there were fewer cars and they sold at a lower price. I mean, who didn't know that going into it? Um, the looking forward bit was a bit more of a, uh, a kind of concern to me. I mean, it was... Uh, must made the point about the Cybertruck stuff. I, yeah, I didn't know much what to make of that. But he wanted to talk about a kind of cyclical slowdown in a tough macro economy. And I think he's probably right about that. It will be difficult to sell things into a tough macro economy. But Tesla is priced to grow. It's not priced to get held up by uh, a slow macro economy. When I look at it and I try to do some numbers on it compared to other things that are available, I think they're pricing about 25% um, growth each year for the next decade uh, to get to level with other things that you can buy right now. We can argue backwards and forwards about whether or not that's likely to happen, but every year they go backwards, that number becomes bigger of what's priced in going forwards, assuming the stock doesn't uh, go anywhere here and assuming its competitors do what I think they're going to do, which is not grow at that rate. So um, an example I've been comparing it to recently was Shell. I think Shell's average uh, income is going to be about 5% higher over the next decade than the last because I think oil prices are going to be slightly higher based on the price it sells at and the way it generates cash. And the same goes for Tesla. Tesla's going to grow at 25% to match them. Okay, uh, maybe that's going to happen. Maybe it isn't. But talking about a cyclical slowdown uh, there means that we're going to get behind. And it means that we have uh, work to do to try and catch up here. Maybe the longer term outlook is better. There's loads going on. There's uh, self-driving stuff. There's battery storage. There's supercomputing. There's humanoid robots. There's everything you can name. There's cyber trucks that are going to be there but they're going to be another year away until they start really making a difference to the bottom line here which i think is is also i don't view that positively um make of it what you will i mean i think tesla's uh kind of bulls here are going to tell me that's not disastrous they may well be right about that but i don't think it's good um so i didn't think this was a terrific uh report um i don't think i'm going to change anybody's mind about anything uh on that on that score though steve at the risk of upsetting people here, oh, good. here I thought we go. this was probably one of the worst reports we've had so far. The Cybertruck makes me laugh because it looks like something somebody would make in the garage with a hammer and some sheet metal. Um, it's a, it's yeah, a thoroughly... The finished product is so much worse than yeah. what they've what they've been showing, isn't it? It's, it, it's, it's a thoroughly yeah. unimpressive looking car. It is, is one it of the most awful looking things I've ever seen in my life. they don't manufacture this thing in, in hole that you're cross about it? <laughs> <laughs> Bastards. Um, but no, I I I had a, a, a few because I posted up these earnings on the trading two on two community, and I thought these were massively unimpressive. Um, there's a, a, a for, and I had so many people saying you, you can't think of Tesla as a car company; it's a tech company. Well, like eighty percent of its revenue still is derived from cars. So how am I supposed to look at it? And all the other things are just like hopium. Um, sort of Elon solar and dis- batteries getting better, right? Solar and batteries getting a bit better. Well, this that is the thing, though. So be... solar, solar grew, uh, batteries grew. The, the margin on those improved, yet the operating margins on Tesla now have fallen that far that they're they're the mm-hmm. same as Volkswagen. The operating margins yeah. on Tesla are the same as Volkswagen, and Volkswagen isn't the best car manufacturer. That means it's worse than Mercedes Benz, worse than BMW, worse than Stellantis. So I'm sat there having a bunch of people like saying to me, it's a tech company. You've got to think of it like a tech company where its margins have fallen so far from tech, they've fallen to car manufacturer. Um, <laughs> and then people saying, well, you know, you've got to value it like a tech company. Well, it is valued like a tech company because if you add up all of the car manufacturers in the uh, – in in the world, you get to the valuation of of Tesla. It trades at what eighty times earnings before this report. I don't know what it is now. It's it's nine times sales premium to Toyota, the next most highly valued um, hundred uh, times car, free cash flow uh, by company. Because um, Tesla is 
Tesla is a, a car company. Free, free cash flow was a joke. There's 808 million, but 500 mm-hmm. of that was from regulatory credits. So you sub them off because eventually someone's got to get wise to the fact that they're just getting a cash handout every every quarter. So if we're saying 303 million of cash flow on what an 81, 81 billion, uh, sorry, 808 billion market cap company, you're talking about what annualize that at 1.2 billion. What's that, 65 years to get your money back in terms of cash flow? That's just a it's just a joke. I just uh, honestly, yeah, if I, this company falls in half, it'd be like oh, shocked face. Do you know what I mean? It's completely <laughs> yeah. a zero interest rate, overvalued company, and I don't even have a dog in the fight. I don't even have a short position against it. Don't short anything. I just think it's just a zero interest rate story. That's 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 unraveling the way zero interest rate stories unravel. That was his big, big uh, defense. Really, was uh, high interest rates, wasn't it? it was, uh, well, but he, but it wasn't any. The, the interest rates weren't affecting anything to do with Tesla. It was all the, the customer. The customer couldn't afford their cards. We need to make our cars cheaper. Blah blah blah. It wasn't. We've because they haven't taken out a lot of debt. They, you know, they they're not particularly indebted, but their suppliers are, and there's a lot of problems there. They've had to raise raise prices. So they're missing out on half half the story at least that's what it seemed to be in the uh earnings call and one of their products now has gone terribly wrong and he's half admitted it i expect probably in the next year um the full admission will probably come out around about the cyber truck and the did you see the absolute chart crime that they put on the presentation where they had i didn't watch it price to produce a tesla model 3 i think it was and in the top was a line going from the very, very top of the chart all the way to a, the very, very bottom. It was like, look at this huge, steep decline. The difference was six hundred and fifty dollars. You're like, yeah, I've they've seen gone it. from like it's, thirty-seven uh, to thirty-six, three fifty or something like that. You're like, that is an absolute chart crime. Do you know what I mean? It was just ridiculous. Yeah, the, Tesla do that all the time, though. They they've done it with battery uh, improvement. They did it from they show again the same thing. Big line from the top, big line to the bottom, and the difference was like three years. And it was like, uh, hold on, guys, you've made the chart really small there. Um, let's let's uh, stretch this out and see exactly what the what the, how far the line goes. So yeah, it's uh, it, there's there's a lot of smoke and mirrors with Tesla. I think that's um, one of the problems why I can't really get my head around it. You have to really believe in it to uh, want to buy into this thing. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I didn't want to be too, too harsh, but I think it's going that way, isn't it? Uh, pretty much, yeah. We're going to get some cross people in the comments, <laughs> um, and maybe justifiably, right? I mean, none of us is that impressed by it, but smarter people than us are in some some cases. Elon is very good. I, you're not going to get the full admission the Cybertruck's gone wrong. You're going to get a, something that says it's time to focus on the humanoid robot or something like that, by the way, which you'll have to decode into uh, saying the Cybertruck hasn't been the success that we'd hoped. When I think about Tesla, I come down to one thought here, which is that this price is much too high uh, at the moment. Um, you need It's hoping for a lot, and I'm not sure I see hoping for a lot. I do like a lot of what they have, though. The US charging stuff... That, to me, looks like big money business. The trouble is you have to pay even bigger money business for it to be worth it. So if the thing got cut in half, I might start get, I might start trying to work out how much I think uh, a standard US charging thing could be worth to um, Tesla, even if you ignore the, the cars it's making and, and all the rest of that stuff. Um, it's... I, I, you're right about the debt thing, by the way, uh, Paul. Company, company like Tesla absolutely shouldn't have any debt. If your stock's traded that high for the last however long, you shouldn't be borrowing money to go and fund stuff. You should be doing it by printing as many shares as you need, which I think is what they've done, uh, and randomly splitting your stock to make it go even higher, which is also what they've done. Um, and uh, I, I was going to bring bring it to on like to that, that because mm. you mentioned there the Tesla network charger it has to mm. it has to be rolled out, doesn't it? Which is going to cost a lot in development. It's going to cost a lot in in just simple capex so how do they get that money they still have the option of taking out debt but they probably wouldn't advise that in this in this uh environment although technically five percent uh interest rates is normal that's what we're being told now um but they can still print you know there's there's still a huge market cap on there they could still print a lot more shares and still gain a hell of a lot more money out of that that sounds like the kind of thing that there ought to be some sort of government assisted funding thing for right building out a massive ev charging power station thing i mean what what else is the us investing in if it's not 
the most promising bit of um like green tech stuff that i can think of right now um you know ev ev infrastructure basically uh war i think is taking a bit of a precedent at the minute so uh yay <laughs> mm, okay right i think we can wrap it up there can't we yeah i think that'll probably do uh well a comment down below what did you think of um our horrendously misguided thoughts on tesla what is it we're all missing um and ideally try and help us see what we're missing in a way that isn't just pointing at bits of the business and saying but it's got this and got this because yeah. i know i'd be the really interested in working Kool-Aid. out I'd be interested in working out how it is all these bits of business add up to uh, the market cap for where we're at at the moment. That's the bit that I really struggle to see. But let us know down below. Oh, Steve, sorry, go on. Sorry, my, fav- my favourite thing to ask Tesla people Kathy. is, could, oh, could you do that for me with the maths? And then all of a sudden they go, <laughs> no. Because oh my God. it's like they, they work out all the maths and then they need to work out a 600 billion hole. Yeah, there's, I mean, Kathy, Kathy Wood's probably the best one at that, right? I, I, she's been quiet for a while now. They get to a 600 billion hole and Still they go, oh, but about... Jet, Jetsons robots and cars built out of sheet yeah. metal and the paint's yeah, going to be better. humanoids. SpaceX. <laughs> We're hoping to end this in the next two hours, so let's stop talking about Tesla for a bit, <laughs> shall we? Right, thank you all very much for listening. We'll see yeah. you next week on the Playing Footsie Show. Bye for now.